okay here we go uh, this is going to be a, a short video uh, that covers some uh, items for consideration as we try to develop local HF communication amongst uh, various ham groups that are loosely situated around Interstate 80 in the uh, the center part of the state so here we'll get started So if we take a look at uh, uh, the map of uh, Pennsylvania, the various counties, what we're talking about in terms of local is uh, the initial counties of Jefferson, uh, Clearfield, and Center. And uh, the uh, I just had a senior moment. <laughs> So these are the ones that we're working with uh, together uh, to begin with. So uh, I think it's also a good idea maybe to consider keeping in the back of our minds uh, some other counties that are adjacent to us that, uh, that once we get uh, a handle on what we're doing amongst the, the three initial counties, uh, it may make sense to see about uh, getting in touch with these other counties because each of these marked counties, Indiana, Armstrong, Clarion, and Elk, have a pretty uh, uh, good size and strong contingent of hams and uh, ham clubs. So uh, it wouldn't be all bad once we get our ducks in a row to maybe uh, uh, broach the subject with some of these other clubs. Um, in fact, they they might already be doing this for all we know. But, uh, well, I think if we go through it ourselves, uh, developing the uh, the process will be a little smarter at the end than if we just uh, copy it from somebody. But that's just my opinion. So one of the first things I thought we'd do is kind of go back and take a look at some propagation uh, information. I think everything that we're going to show here is uh, included in the uh, te uh, test study for the licenses. but. Uh, We'll just go back and touch base uh, again. Uh, so first thing we'll talk about a little bit is uh, take a look at some antenna plots and how you visualize uh, what the uh, radiation is, uh, electromagnetic radiation is doing uh, off of the antenna. Uh, take a look at uh, uh, types of uh, propagation. Uh, there's three primary uh, types of propagation. You have sky wave, uh, line of sight, and ground wave, and we'll, uh, those should at least sound familiar to you, uh, but we'll go back and uh, review it just to make sure. Then uh, the other thing that plays a big factor in all this is the topography between the locations. So I've got some uh, slides that'll show uh, what the topography is between uh, the various locations, for example, between Treasure Lake and uh, the city of Clearfield and uh, Punxsutawney and uh, Phillipsburg. And I think you might find that kind of interesting. And then I'll conclude with uh, some of my observations. And again, that's just what it is. Um, you know, nothing here is in stone. I just thought this might be a good platform to kind of get some discussion going and a little basic understanding as we get into this a little deeper. So the first thing I want to take a look at is the uh, half-wave dipole. Uh, I think everybody's uh, familiar with what that is. Um, and we'll take a look at the uh, uh, propagation uh, plot. Um, and the way to look at this, this is a uh, um, 6.9 megahertz dipole 30 feet above the ground. Now the way this is oriented here, this is a top down. So say if we're up in a plane looking down at the antenna, the antenna is running in this direction, east and west, and then the uh, lobe of propagation uh, will look something like this coming off of that antenna. A um, little bit of a null, not quite a full null on the ends and uh, the highest gain is uh, directly off the um, uh, broadside of the antenna. And this plot is that same envelope, but 
from the ground. Say we're standing right on the ground. Uh, here's the ground and the propagation uh, gain will be look something like this. Again with the, uh, the maximum gain up here at the top. So this one is a the same antenna oriented the same way but instead of 30 feet above the ground it's 60 feet and you can see that the uh, the propagation pattern has changed a little bit it's a little more uh, getting closer to uh, a, a theoretical dipole theoretical dipole this null would be all the way in at zero <clears throat> on a theoretical dipole you'd have uh, no propagation off the tip the ends of the dipole but in actuality you do on a practical dipole one that's a uh, real and actually usable uh, you just have kind of a dip here instead of a complete null to zero and you can see that the uh, the vertical uh, uh, propagation pattern has changed uh, starting to develop uh, directions out here uh, where the higher gain, the high gain is located. And then finally if uh, we go from 60 feet to 90 feet you can see uh, the propagation pattern a little bit more necking on the nulls here uh, a little higher uh, concentration of the power going up and we're starting to develop these uh, side lobes which is uh, what uh, you kind of like to see in uh, uh, for DX. Uh, we're not going to get into that, but that's uh, uh, something to uh, make note of. So the thing to realize here is that by adjusting the height above ground of a dipole, we can adjust this uh, vertical or side view propagation pattern. So that's just a, a tool we'll have in our toolbox. And from uh, a 3D visualization standpoint, uh, it's important to recognize that what's actually propagating is a shape similar to this for the uh, 30 uh, foot high dipole uh, so it's kind of a big uh, blob uh, symmetric blob that's radiating out uh, from the antenna it's just not single lines uh, so that's you'll see these 3d visualizations uh, for propagation plots and it really gives you a better feel for the, the shape of the actual uh, propagation pattern Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the three types of uh, propagation, uh, the sky waves, line of sight, and the ground waves. And we'll start with the uh, uh, sky waves. And these are signals that are transmitted up into the air. And they are reflected and refracted from the ionosphere uh, back down to the ground. And you can see here we're transmitting from a single point uh, the envelope, uh, that 3D envelope uh, comes up and hits the ionosphere and then it's uh, reflected and refracted down so that this is the area that the sky wave covers. And what you have here in the middle, you hear uh, people talk about the skip zone. This is a uh, section of the earth that the signal doesn't uh, go to. So what happens here is that the uh, the signal will skip over this area and you can't hear uh, the station. And uh, as an example, uh, one year I was trying to do the uh, 13 colonies and there was a station in New Kensington that was transmitting uh, one of the uh, the stations for the contest and they were on 20 meters which is uh, a frequency that typically has a longer path for uh, skywave 
and it's probably we were probably sitting about just the way this uh, uh, diagram is, is showing so the transmitter was down here they were transmitting over our heads and I could never get that signal uh, but I could see on the spotting pages that they were being picked up out here by the uh, uh, people that were farther away so uh, so that's kind of the uh, how the sky wave works uh, another thing you might hear in terms of sky waves is a reference to maximum usable frequency and that's a value that changes uh, quite a bit but what it is it's the maximum frequency uh, where you can get the refraction from the ionosphere back down if you go to a higher frequency than that maximum uh, usable frequency then the signal goes off into space and uh, it's just lost uh, so sometimes that's why you'll see uh, uh, 10 meters 12 meters 15 drop out uh, kind of a blackout because you're not able to bend that signal back to the ground because of the ionosphere the other thing about the ionosphere to keep in mind is that it's not static uh, you know, you see the pictures and it's drawn as a, a concentric shell around the earth. Uh, but the way I envision it is that the ionosphere is pretty dynamic. The sun's always hammering it with uh, radiation and energy. And that radiation and ener energy varies. So this ionosphere is constantly changing. It's, uh, uh, you know, if you wanted to visualize it, just go look at the ocean. And I think that's the same type of uh, uh, dynamic that we have going on in the ionosphere. And that's the reason there's a lot of variation uh, in signals, fading, uh, losing signals, um, just uh, a lot of variability up there in the ionosphere. It's changing height all the time. Um, it collapses. There's two uh, F layers. They collapse into one at night. So, you know, there's it's just not a static uh, um, sphere up there that's uh, bouncing signals around uh, nice and uniformly. Okay. Um, okay, the next uh, propagation uh, uh, mode we'll take a look at is line of sight. Uh, that's just what it says where the uh, antenna can maybe not actually see, but a straight line can be drawn from the antenna, uh, the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna. Uh, this is typically the way the uh, signal is transmitted uh, on a UHF or VHF repeater. Uh, just You need to have both antennas uh, lined up so if uh, they had eyeballs they could see each other. And then the other uh, component of propagation is referred to as a ground wave. And this is the part of the signal that comes off the antenna and it will to a, a degree follow the curvature of the earth and then uh, attenuate as the, the farther away it gets. And that's what that's showing, that signal, that uh, it eventually fades away but you can get some um, transmission of uh, signal to follow the earth in ground wave uh, which could be used for uh, nearby communications. So that's just a, a look at the three uh, types of propagation, the sky waves, the uh, line of sight, and the ground waves. Now this is a look at um, near incident vertical sky wave and uh, I believe uh, you probably should have at least seen this in the uh, the study groups for both the general and maybe even the technician I can't remember but certainly in the general you would have seen this but essentially what it is it's a technique for propagation that uh, it takes the signal from the antenna that goes up and bounces it off of the uh, ionosphere and comes down nearby in a uh, coverage area that's uh, relatively close to the antenna. Uh, so what you need to be able to do is, is somehow 
uh, emphasize that uh, upwards component of propagation so it'll come down typically uh, it's uh, pretty much limited to 40 and 80 meters and you can get about a 200 to 300 mile uh, coverage uh, using this this approach and then the other thing to uh, keep in mind uh, using this approach is that if you um, uh, say if you're down in a valley and uh, you use NVIS you're able to reach stations in other valleys uh, also up on the, the peaks of the, uh, the mountains too but that's something to keep in mind as a, a potential tool that uh, we might be uh, able to use so uh, this is the uh, near ver near incident vertical sky wave referred to or abbreviated as NVIS and um, these pages are uh, have more information on that if you're interested in that so if we go back and look at the antenna propagation based on what we just saw uh, it would indicate that if we get a dipole um, lower to the ground than we normally try to do for when we're looking for um, uh, long distance propagation. Uh, if we bring it down say 30 feet or lower we get a much more pronounced vertical lobe here and that may be a good tool, a good way to accomplish NVIS uh, for uh, local communication say the 2 to 300 mile uh, radius of where we're at. So uh, we'll keep that in mind as we uh, go along here. Now the other factor that we need to look at is the topography uh, that's uh, separating our um, clubs. And uh, what I did is um, I went to this website, heywhatsthat.com, um, and what it does is it allows you to um, set a location and then go to another location and uh, set that position and then it'll show you the terrain, the uh, elevation between in this case this would be my house in Treasure Lake and downtown Clearfield. Uh, which is kind of where I've got, or maybe it's by the interstate anywhere, wherever that X is. So it shows you the, uh, the infamous, infamous mountain that keeps us from uh, communicating uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, but it's also the highest point on Interstate 80 east of the Mississippi, so it does have some notoriety. Um, so we can use this tool and take a look at... Uh, what the terrain is um, to see whether say for example ground wave might be a consideration or how NVIS might work and um, just look at all the different uh, pairings of uh, the towns that we're um, working with. So this is a look at uh, Treasure Lake to Clearfield and you can see the uh, terrain there now we're going to take a look at Treasure Lake to Phillipsburg, you know, so obviously it's a little further down the road, uh, but here's Clearfield, here's, here's Phillipsburg, and here we are in Treasure Lake, and this is the uh, terrain uh, to Phillipsburg. See we've got a couple of humps there that uh, can be a problem, but it's only about 40, uh, what's that, yeah, 30 miles, 40 miles, uh, the way the crow flies. Uh, so here again uh, we probably aren't going to be able to use uh, ground wave to any effect uh, between Treasure Lake and Phillipsburg. Now let's take a look at Treasure Lake to Punxsy. So here we are up in Treasure Lake We're going down to Punxsy. I've just picked downtown Punxsy and you can see we have a lot. It's lower elevation but we're still relatively uh, blocking everything. Uh, so there again, uh, probably, uh, not probably, we won't be able to use ground wave uh, propagation to communicate with Punxsutawney and HF, uh, but the NVIS uh, might work if we're uh, clever enough. 
and then here we go clear field to Punxsutawney and same thing a lot of uh, uh, elevation in our way uh, so ground waves not going to work and then we go Punxsy to Phillipsburg uh, you can see we've still got that ridge to get over there and then there's another one similar to what we were seeing uh, Treasure Lake to uh, Phillipsburg so you know ground waves aren't going to uh, work for us here but that's not to say that ground waves can't work for locally say if uh, you're in Punxsutawney maybe the Punxsutawney people can communicate uh, using ground wave uh, but what would have to be done is they would want to go into this website and spot the different stations that may want to communicate and see what the uh, uh, profile looks like, the terrain profile looks like as uh, they're going uh, through that. So these are just some my observations and I'm sure everybody uh, will have some of their own uh, we need to kind of get those out and discuss them but it looks to me like we'll probably need to use NVIS uh, 80 meter and 40 meter would be the most likely uh, frequencies for inter-county HF communication due to the terrain the ground uh, wave just isn't going to uh, do us any good there uh, ground wave may be capable for nearby communications, possibly 10 meters and uh, digital modes. Uh, but again, we'd have to study that on a case-by-case -case basis, but it could still be a good tool. Uh, and we also need to uh, consider VHF, UHF, and GMRS linked repeaters as a possibility. Uh, but in order for it to be valid for uh, emergency communications in my opinion again it's just my opinion uh, we shouldn't use the internet or cell phone technology or the grid uh, because that's what we're preparing to be without uh, so that's just a, another consideration but it would appear to me that with some uh, playing around with NVIS uh, we should be able to establish some uh, good uh, communications amongst the uh, different clubs which is what the objective of this exercise is and uh, we've done a little work a few of us have uh, played around on 10 meters with uh, trying with locally in the Treasure Lake area and uh, we've kind of come up with this schedule of uh, frequencies for various uh, uh, functions and uh, we just picked uh, 28.100 uh, Verichat, uh, which is a digital um, uh, program. It's just a chat program uh, that you can use to chat over the uh, HF uh, frequency bands. Uh, 28.120 for in, in beams, which is a, a narrow beam emergency message system and PSK31 uh, could use this frequency uh, we've done that uh, to, to some degree uh, established that that was we were able to communicate at that frequency using uh, both of these and uh, in that digital mode uh, it, it appears to be fairly standard to use a 1500 Hertz offset and if you're familiar with the digital modes you know what that means um, if you're not, then uh, we need to get you familiar with them because it's a pretty good uh, uh, technique for emergency communications. Uh, we've picked 28.150 as one link peer to peer. Um, one link is uh, an email program uh, that you can transmit emails from one station to another. Uh, you can also transmit emails from one station to uh, other stations that are tied to the internet and send email messages to non-HAM uh, recipients. Uh, but for what we were looking for was uh, sending email messages from, say, my station to somebody else's station and uh, back and forth. And then we picked uh, 28.410 uh, single sideband. 
uh, phone upper sideband uh, mode uh, for voice and uh, that makes sure the uh, the technicians uh, they're I forget it's uh, I think it's 28.3 to 28.5 megahertz is a legal range for technicians to do phone on 10 meters so we wanted to make sure that that frequency that we use uh, would be within that technician uh, privilege uh, band and uh, so we get the most uh, exposure we can. So this is just kind of a, an up status of uh, where we're at with some of this stuff just uh, in case uh, anybody wanted to know. And I think that's about all I know. So this is K3SKS73.